Yeah, and um, so you get me. And um, this is our annual business meeting. So um, I'm to tell you that the financial report will be available in January after we have the December figures. And Wes will make sure that's available for anyone who wants to look at it. And um, we need to elect the board of directors at this meeting. So uh, would people who are on the board now raise your hands? Okay, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six of us. And um, Wes, and then the vice president, Fred Goodman. And we could use a couple more people. And if anyone would like to nominate someone from the floor, please say so now. Anyone would in, be interested maybe themselves? We could use new ideas, new blood, spread the, spread the tasks around. Well, talk to me afterwards if you didn't want to say anything here now. Um, otherwise, if it's, I'm not exactly sure how to do this. I think I need to still ask for a show of hands um, to reelect the members who are on the board now. So that would be me, Gretchen Anderson, Kim Tornadson here in the front row, uh, Janine Aker back at the table with the memberships and the journals, um, Edradine Havdi in the blue jacket here in the middle, and uh, two rows behind her, Donna Pattinson and Susan Kingman. Um, I don't think we need to do them individually. I don't recall that we ever have. So, um, if, and Frank, Fred Goodman, who's not here, and uh, Wes, who's not here. So if you're happy with the board and the way it's running, um, who would like to reelect these same board members? Show of hands. I don't know. If, okay, so we have a, a move for the board anyway. Um, and anyone opposed that would like to say something else? Okay, so the same members will stay on the board as long as they're willing and able. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, the other thing we usually do at our December meetings, uh, besides handing out the journals to those who are in uh, good membership standing, is to have the open mic so people who are um, working on some research they want to tell you about in a preliminary form, or you're seeking information that you would like other people to know about, so maybe they know of a source that you could use or something like that. Um, you can have up to 10 minutes to speak here, and we've only had one person sign up to be interested tonight, and so if you'd like to do that, please let me know. Candace D. Wellman has something to, that she'd like to talk about, so we'll call her up and um, hope there are others of you. Thank you. I can do it without the mask. Thank God. Oh. I can't talk through these things in any way that's even barely comprehensible. So I'm Candace Wellman. For some of you may not have been here through my 20-year journey of research and writing, uh, my first book with Washington State University Press was uh, Peace Weavers with uh, biographies of four indigenous women who married county officials and military officers here in the 1850s and 60s. WSU Press did not want to publish my entire manuscript because they want to keep the size of their books the same, so they made me pick four out of eight women after I'd started with 22, completed eight biographies, um, they made me pick four, but it started selling immediately, and so they told me uh, to get the other four ready. 
So the first book, Peace Weavers, was published in 2017, and the second one in 2019, which is kind of an important year, health-wise, for all of us. And um, I had done 20 author events around the region when all of a sudden, you know, we all had to go home. And so I had to cancel six of them and uh, go back inside, and so the books just had to sell on their own. Um, so I just started reading fun stuff for quite some time, and then I was like, okay, we need to like get back to work, and you're sitting at home, and you have nothing but time to sit and write all day, and I already had all the research done for this book that is now in the publishing pipeline. So my new book is completely different than the first two. It is called um, Edmund C. Fitzhugh, Washington Territorial Justice, Man of Treacherous Charm. Um, we know him here as the man who came in 1854 to supervise and manage the new coal mine, which became familiarly known as the Seaholm Mine. Um, he also was our very first county auditor, and that was the last um, elective office that he um, ever held. The research for this man was really fun because it just got me into some wonderful places back in Virginia where he came from and, and other places. So he was uh, from an elite family in Virginia and became a lawyer back there and a legislator like his father had been. Small town boy though, town of 500 or less, 60% um, or 70% of which were slaves in his small town. So when the California gold rush started, then he heads for California to be a lawyer out there because the best way to make money during the California gold rush was to make money off the miners not be a miner. And so that's what he was doing, and he also got recruited into the politics in California by uh, Edmund Randolph, his law partner, whose ancestor signed the Declaration of Independence, another Virginia boy. And he got very deeply into politics there. So when coal was found here, a syndicate was founded to own this, to buy the property and own it and start the mine. Um, one of his um, law partners was part of that syndicate. And so they sent him up here with zero mining experience to get that mine opened. But their major focus was for him to help start the Democratic Party in Washington Territory and with the hopes that eventually there would be a power block in Congress of Washington, Oregon, and California, which was a brand new state itself. So um, he was kind of a, uh, what well, we'd call him a political hack, kind of, and a political operative. Uh, he was chairman of the Washington Territorial Democratic Committee for a while but he also strong-armed people up here to vote the way he wanted to, so you would get votes that were like, uh, if there's uh, 39 voters, the, the vote would go 39 to zero because he controlled so much stuff around here. Um, he kidnapped his own children, and his, he w married to two indigenous wives here. They left him at that point after he kidnapped their children um, then he killed somebody in the back garden. And so when he was appointed territorial justice, he was actually under indictment for murder at that point when he was appointed by the president and tried for murder by his fellow justices, um, which that trial didn't last very long. Um, eventually, he has four wives within 10 years he goes to the Civil War where his friend George Pickett from here and other family friends, uh, Robert E. Lee's mother was a Fitzhugh. Uh, so Robert E. Lee was his cousin. 
and I'm thinking there was another one. And so he ends up in Pickett's division as a um, assistant attorney, assistant adjutant general, which are the guys that do the paperwork. He ends up kind of a hero at the end because Pickett's division was down to like 39 men when they walked into Appomattox and Fitz, he was one of the two officers left. Um, after the Civil War, oh, then he comes back out here, finds his children, they tell him to go to hell. He, he ends up in California where he dies alone on the floor of a flop house. Um, interesting man, beyond what we know of him here in Bellingham. And um, so I'm hoping that manuscript's gonna go fast. But I finished it in probably a year less than I would have otherwise because I was locked up at home and had nothing else to do. Since that manuscript has been under review, then I also got restless, so I started another book. This one based on three days of oral history I took with my grandmother in 1983, um, which transcripted into um, 29 and a half pages of single space typing. So I'm now working with the Quincy Valley Historical Museum. Does anybody know where Quincy is over in Columbia Basin? Um, yeah, it's my great-grandfather and grandfather, their hometown where I grew up. And so I'm going to work with them on a little book based on my grandmother's life. And it will probably be one of those 8 by 11 things that's stapled together and sells for ten dollars maybe and it will raise some funds for them. Um, I'm also being invited to help with the 150th anniversary of the pig war which will be next summer out on uh, San Juan Island and uh, I'm very pleased about that because I like talking about Mrs. Pickett who is one of the biographies in the second book. So thank you. Anyone else want to share research or ideas? Yes, would, would you like to come up? Merry Christmas. Uh, I'm, I'm Dean Kahn. I was uh, one of the two co-editors of the, for the last, this year and last year of, of the journal. And what I thought I'd do is instead of talking about what's in it, because I hope most of you have your copy by now, and maybe you've scan at least scanned the table of contents, I thought I'd, I'd talk a bit about uh, how the stories came to us, uh, just to show kind of the range of ways stories end up in here, and to encourage you all and, and or people you know, uh, who would be interested in contributing uh, an article to the journal where um, we always welcome contributions. It, something whether it's researched uh, your family history here, uh, family business, um, if you're working on a book that, uh, or an article for, uh, that has a Whatcom County history connection, we're often interested uh, in, in things you've learned out of that or kind of a slice of a bigger project. Um, there's all sorts of ways that uh, um, articles come to us and, and people who family have been here a long time or if you've, you grew up here, we've, we've run articles about kind of life in the early days, um, kind of personal memoirs, uh, those kinds of things we're in, interested in also. Um, but just running through the ones that made it to this issue, the the very first one about a, uh, sort of a, uh, a fairly modern kind of distinctive architectural house up by uh, by the university uh, that was designed and built by an early woman art professor at Western, J. Ruth J. Ruth Kelsey. Um, we ended up with this article because I'm a participant participate in basically an old guy's walking group. And one of, uh, one of the, my fellow walkers um, is a semi-retired uh, local architect. 
and uh, I knew him on an acquaintance level, so we would walk and talk, and uh, I may have mentioned the journal, and he, he mentioned that the house that he and his wife bought and restored, which is this house, uh, was listed on the city's register of historic homes, and he told me about the home. I mean, he's an architect, so he had a, an interest in the particular kind of design of the home, that era. And he told me about the woman, the art professor, and it, it sounded interesting to me. And he, of course, he had gathered a lot of information to submit uh, his home to be added to the city's register. So uh, uh, he basically availed that information of us, and we kind of tweaked it a bit, and that became uh, one of our articles. Uh, the second uh, article about the uh, early um, fire of a of an opera house in Plain. Well, that's written by Todd Warger, who's manning the desk downstairs. And if you know Todd, he's always got um, iron projects in the fire. And, uh, and he's probably has at least one article in many, many journals. So he's one of the first people we always contact and say, you got anything for us? And this is what he happened to have this time. So we have a little bit of a kind of a regular cadre of people, maybe not every year, but on a fairly regular basis, submit, uh, submit articles. Um, the third one, this article about George Sherman, that was something I wrote I, several years ago. I sort of, I used to have a, a stronger interest in poetry. I still have some interest and in history. So at one point, I decided to blend those and come up, write about former or poet, deceased poets who had Whatcom County connections. And I kind of went through a surge of research and then they've been drilling out in the last two or three journals since. George Sherman is the last of that bunch uh, that I had earlier gathered information on and that probably will be the last one I've done. So uh, the Peace Underground, the ep local effort to help people uh, back during the Vietnam War to go up to Canada to uh, evade the draft. That was uh, written by a local city council member, Don Hamill. And I think I'd heard secondhand that he had been researching that for a number of years. And um, so we just reached out to him and said, you know, would you be interested and, uh, and in putting together an article? And he was, and I think that's a certainly uh, a different kind of article in that, as you can imagine, people at the time were helping uh, people uh, break the law by going up into Canada to avoid the draft or uh, uh, evade the military. And that was something that they weren't writing articles about and doing historical research on. Uh, being quiet and discreet was the name of the game. So it's, it was a different sort of topic and, and Dan, and then with some assistance from other people, spent a number of years tracking people down and interviewing the local people who assisted that, uh, people getting across the border and interviewed people here and who are, some who are still up in Canada who were the uh, recipients of their help. So it's an interesting topic in that it's something that's, uh, I mean, there's Certainly there are articles in history, but sort of ground level research is something like that rather than going back to an old history topic that was covered in the day by uh, you know, newspapers of the day or, or historians that spent a lot of time on, especially at a local level. Do you want to come up? And As it happens, I just saw T Todd in the back, although he stepped away, but he's, uh, he's got an article he's planning to submit 
submitting for next year's journal, which will be about um, Uniflight building the patrol boats that were used in Vietnam. So, and uh, all that went into it, and I guess it was quite a challenge getting uh, getting the military to go go for the project. There's Todd. If you want to raise your hand, he's a regular contributor. Um, uh, the next article, a profile of uh, Dr. Uh, Boynton. Um, that was written by a woman named uh, Jan Pearson, who uh, I knew a, a little bit because her grandmother was Sue Boynton, who's kind of the namesake of founding spirit for a local poetry contest. And some time ago on Facebook, she had shared a photo and a bit of information about her grandfather. Uh, and I just, so I just contacted contacted her through Facebook. You want to, you've got information on them, how about an article? And, and she's a writer anyway, she writes uh, fiction, but she pulled something together on her family member. The Community Food Co-op, I, I had noticed last year that they were coming up on their 50th anniversary. And I thought, well, a local business like that that reaches out to the community a lot, they're, they're gonna gather information on their history for their own newsletter, for community events. Maybe they could share, us, share with us uh, an article. And they were happy to do it last year, but then the pandemic hit, so they kind of toned down their community events. So basically that article and their projects uh, uh, were delayed for a year, but the results showed up this year. And finally, uh, William Kaufman, kind of a county assessor who stirred the political waters. Um, this is an article that came in unsolicited. It was an email from a, a man named Charles LeWarren, whose name rang a bell. Years ago, he wrote a book called Utopias on Puget Sound. I still remember it. it you can find it pretty readily. Uh, it came out from UW Press, uh, a history of various utopian communities. Um, in, in the Northwest, including uh, Equality Colony, I think, believe down by where Blanchard. Uh, well, Kaufman had a kind of a tangential connection to that, but it was somebody he'd come across in his research for his book, and he's written a number of other books on state history. But he, he, was, he had a lot of information, and he was interested in Kaufman, who had a much more extended involvement in, uh, in Whatcom County and Bellingham. He was county assessor and had a short-lived run for governor. Um, so that was just something that showed up in our door via email. So you never know what's gonna show up. We always go out and reach out to people who have contributed in the past, who might have book projects, uh, but we're, we don't close the door on any possibility. And if you haven't written that much for uh, for public consumption, we've, uh, we're, we, we're happy to work with you in terms of editing what you've written, helping you track with photos if that's necessary and such. And the last thing is, uh, after all this, Colby and I are both decided to step back as lead editors or co-lead editors. We're still gonna be involved with the journal, but then we had to figure out, well, there needs to be an editor for the journal. And we started asking around and I just wanted to let you all know that we found, I think, probably perhaps the person best qualified to do that, and and uh, um, and, and that's Lane Morgan. If if uh, if you don't know about Lane, uh, I mean, she's lived in Sumas and Bellingham for most of her life. She's a uh, writer and editor for History Link, uh, the online of Washington History Encyclopedia. Uh, she currently also edits, helps edit uh, articles for Salish Current, online news site. She used to work for the Bellingham Herald and the Linden Tribune. She's taught journalism. She's written or edited a number of books. Um, she's taught journalism and history in, in uh, local high schools and at Western. And although all of what she does and uh, stands on her own experience, she also happens to be the daughter of Murray Morgan. Um, perhaps the best known name of, uh, among local uh, or Northwest historians. Anyway, she's gonna be the new editor, which I think is great. And if any of you have any interest in potentially submitting an article, I feel, 
can contact me either tonight or we'll get out information as to how do you can contact Wayne. Thank you. Todd, did you want to say anything about what you're researching now? You can say no. <laughs> I didn't put you on the spot. Hi, I'm Todd Borger. I worked at the museum here for about 27 years now. Seeing how Dean's already brought up the, the uh, river patrol boat uh, with Uniflight uh, story I was working on. Um, uh, anyways, I'll, it's a good opportunity, I guess, to bring up two projects that uh, I've been working on. So it's interesting that uh, during the time of COVID, I guess it was either writing over the past two years or baking sourdough, uh, which my girlfriend's been doing quite a bit of. So I compromised by, uh, by watching the Great British Bake Off instead. But I did do a lot of writing. So uh, two of the projects that uh, I had the opportunity to work on um, for some time, uh, Steve Paz uh, of the Waka Maritime Association has been wanting me to put together um, a book of some sort um, regarding uh, shipbuilders and boat builders of Whatcom County over time. I had done two exhibits here at the museum some time ago now. I think, I think one was like 22 years ago and the other one's got to be at least 10 years ago. But um, fortunately, during the shutdown, I had all my material in the basement, dug it all out, got a hold of Steve, and I said, okay, it seems like I got all the time in the world. So I just pretty much just finished it for him, and I believe they're going to be publishing it through uh, Village Books at uh, their Chuck It On editions. Um, I haven't handed it in yet. I'm probably going to do it by the end of the month anyways. But um, basically, I was looking at, um, from the time of uh, uh, Rotor building the HC, um, what was that name? HC, help me, Can Candace, what was the uh, Rotor's ship there that, that he built? The HC? Page. What's that? The HC page. page, that's right. I had another ship on my mind so <laughs> that's just too many boats and too many ships i was dealing with it <laughs> anyways uh from that time period up until about the mid 1960s um i found a lot of boat yards a lot of shipyards that were totally lost in time uh, a lot of photos that were here at the museum that were not documented there were unknowns and we were able to figure out what they were um uh, so I don't know the, the, the title. I think it's kind of tentatively at this time, like something like Shipyard, um, Short Histories of Whatcom County uh, boat, uh, bo boat Builders and Shipyards. I was able to find a lot of oral histories that went with um, uh, many of the, the, the builders that were done in the 80s. And um, I think it's gonna be pretty, pretty cool. Like I said, there's about 40 uh, of these and I chose the mid, 1960s because I wanted to go up through the time of heavy wood construction, you know, the large wood hull uh, boats, which kind of segued a little bit into um, uh, the times of composites and uh, marine plywood. Um, and uh, of course the age of fiberglass, there was some steel work. And so it leaves them room, um, well, it leaves them room if they want to continue on a second volume, and plus this one was getting too big and out of hand. So I'm guessing that sometime next year uh, we'll have something. Um, interestingly, I, 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 I would, anyways, this uh, month's issue of Vietnam Magazine um, has a, a, a real interesting story that I did of the river patrol boats that I was talking to Dean about. And um, of course, it's more of a condensed version of what I was going for. Um, this is really interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm more curious and more interested in the process 
of uh, getting uh, the story in this. It's a, it's a full feature, double page spread of the uh, a photo in eight pages. And I, I sit here and I still scratch my head of how the heck did this happen? Because I had written this uh, right, right into about the first month of COVID. And when COVID hit, I was like, ah, nobody's doing any work anymore. And I left it on my, my desktop. And this last August, I saw it on there and I was thinking, oh, you know, uh, either do something or don't do anything with it. And so um, Vietnam Magazine, um, they're, well, not just the magazine, but they're a publishing company. They do, uh, uh, was it military history, Civil War, the, the, uh, the Old West, I think it's called, um, American history, and they do all these historical uh, um, bi-monthly magazines. And so for Vietnam, they just said send a, a query. So, you know, typically, like most writers or especially one that's probably not as good as is my I'm not a consider myself a very good writer I'm only as good as my editor but um, I put together a quick query and sent it off and thought well I'll either hear nothing or three four months from now thank you but no thank you I sent it out at seven o'clock in the evening and when I woke up the next morning I had an email from the publisher uh, wanting to see a copy of it I was pretty impressed. I sent the copy at about 8, 8.30 in the morning. When I woke up the next morning, they said they wanted it. So apparently I did something right. And it still mystifies me <laughs> because I've never had anything happen so fast. But um, um, of course, they scaled it down pretty heavily. But uh, the, uh, the premise of the whole thing was that uh, when they built the river patrol boats uh, in Bellingham for the Vietnam War, um, we were the sole ones who, who built them here, and I knew the designer and the owner of uh, Uniflight, or at the time it was United Boat Builders. I also knew um, the son, uh, Steve, who's, uh, who's helped me out a little bit uh, since his father, Art, passed away, and telling me how things didn't exactly go as smooth as his father uh, remembered. And also through our, I was lucky to, um, um, to get in contact with the, uh, I was trying to make, what was his title? He was uh, kind of like the chief of the small boat division for the Navy. He was in retirement in Florida. And so I was able to get his end of the story. Well, what's always bothered me is there was a lot of myths and misconceptions and, and mistakes in, the, in how the whole program uh, came together. And so that was the intent of the, the article was correcting and uh, the assumptions and talking about the whole backdoor scene. So it's, it's kind of got a little bit more of um, uh, technology, it really doesn't have anything to do with combat. Uh, but how the, the whole program was developed. And so uh, in the book and, and uh, probably uh, what I'll give uh, Dean will be what was meant to be um, um, published if, if that were to have been done. So anyways, that's what I've been up to. And um, we'll, uh, this is still at Barnes & Noble if anybody's interested. And if you want to see my earlier advanced copy, I'll have it down at the desk. So, thank you. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to share tonight? Or questions they'd like to ask? Okay, oh, Janine? Oh, Edward Dean has something to say about the Picket House. Thanks. Um, um, I'm Edra Dean Hubdy and president of the Daughters of the Pioneers of Washington and we um, give tours at the Picket House and uh, so therefore I'd like to encourage people to consider every uh, second Sunday of each month from one to four we have tours there and um, we'd like to see a lot of you there. Thank you.
Okay, then I guess we'll finish a little sooner than we typically do. Um, if you didn't pick up your journal and you're in good standing, Janine has them at the back table. If you're not a member and you want to buy one, they're $15, $10. Um, so you can, you can uh, purchase one. There are also cookies, and because of COVID and the requirement to wear masks, we don't put them out, but they're bagged up, so if you'd like to take home a couple bags of cookies, they're on the back table there. Please help yourself. And uh, yes? Can I sure. I'm sorry, did I miss your hand? Well, I did film the top part. You want to film? Well, anyway, I'll introduce myself. I'm uh, Fred Polander from the I'm president of Linden Pioneer Museum out in Linden. And so we've got um, Troy Lunkenberg was uh, uh, curator for, um, and director for 27 years, and he uh, retired uh, in September 15th. And so currently the board is running the museum, and there's uh, Bill Graham, he's from Bellingham, Larry McPhail, and Dan they're in the back there, and Denny DeMeyer and his wife, Denny's vice president, and so we're kind of in um, one of the gals that's been on our board for the last uh, three years, she's going to step up, quit her prior job, and be a director. So we're kind of looking for a curator, or we're kind of to that point. It's going really well. The museum's doing great. But just wondered if the Bellingham Museum, you know, you're kind of in the same thing we're in, had any ideas or... Uh, any direction could point us to where we could uh, direct or curator in museum history. I know we're a little bit different, but it's, you know, Linden, North Whatcom County, kind of an ag-based uh, museum. The way the museum in Linden started in 1976, my grandpa, Fred Polander, number one, I'm number three, had a collection of buggies, 40 carriages, and he, he uh, challenged the city of Linden if they would buy, which was the old uh, John Deere building, tractor building, which was my grandma's brother, that he would donate his collection to the city of Linden. And so he had 40 buggy carriages, which was his life collection. You know, my dad and him had the Clydesdale horses. They showed the Linden Fair forever. And uh, me, I didn't follow their footsteps. If it didn't have a motor on it, I wasn't very interested in it, but anyway. So the museum's doing well, and um, Denny's been working a lot, but so we thought we'd come tonight to your meeting and just see if there was anybody had any ideas, come out and see us and help us kind <clears> of <throat> get a new director, curator down the road or ideas. Anybody wants to be involved, we're more than welcome. We're we got lots of uh, ideas, or if you got any ideas, we're open. Do you have a question? Is there anything like a, a state or national association of community museums? Yeah, see, I'm not, you know, I've been on the board for the last six years, and prior to that in the 80s was on the board. And, uh, but, you know, we kind of, Troy just pretty much ran the thing, and we were just kind of like there. You know, well, when he retired, we stepped up and, and you know, and uh, it's going just fine. But again, we're just kind of searching for um, some direction where you'd find directors, curators, and go ahead. That was the museum. I think it's the Museum Association of Washington. I think that's what it's called. I can give you my card because I'm in touch with one of the members. Oh, okay. And I can put you in touch with them. Have any of you, many of you been out to Linda and seen our museum? Oh, good. Well, thank you. Yeah, we're, we're pretty proud of it. You know, I mean, it's going well. Now, you guys got a beautiful building here, to be honest with you. It's the first time I've been in here. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, um, so, yeah, that's, that's the, why we're here tonight, kind of seeing once if we could uh, pick your brain a little bit. So, anyway.
Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Well, anyway, have a Merry Christmas. Nice meeting you. Have a happy holiday and pick up your journals and your cookies on the way out. Thank you. Thank you.